Good morning again. Uh, welcome to the talk about the state of hardware video codecs in Linux. My name is Andrzej Pietrasiewicz and I prepared this talk together with Nikola Dufresne. Uh, Nikola is a principal software engineer at Colabra, one of the top GStreamer contributors and a kernel codec UAPI and driver contributor. I'm a senior software engineer at Colabra. I write codec drivers and I am a co-author of the stateless VP9 decoding UAPI. We both work for Colabra, but in 2011 I was not working for Colabra. At that time, my colleagues at Samsung R&D Institute Poland were creating something that would later become the very first upstream Linux kernel driver for a hardware video codec. Were the 2011 submission and its prerequisite submissions flawless? They were not. But, on the other hand, there was no prior art. Hardware video codec drivers had not existed before. Mistakes have been corrected and conclusions have been drawn. The driver is still there today, but nowadays it is not the only hardware video codec uh, driver existing upstream. If you want to know how we got where we are with upstream uh, support for video codecs, or you want to know what's still ahead of us in this area, or you want to know how conclusions from previous mistakes will make this future work better, then this talk is for you. But before we delve into the details, let me show you the plan of the talk. First, you will understand what is a video codec and what is a hardware video codec. Then we will talk about codec categories, which there are, and you will see example uses of codecs driven by upstream drivers in real-life applications. You will learn about the history of video codec drivers in upstream Linux kernel, and then we will try predicting the future. In about 30 minutes from now, we will be finishing with a questions and answers session. So what is a codec? It can be either of two things. It can be a specification. For example, good old JPEG spec says how to encode and decode images. It is for still images, but there exists a variant called MJPEG, which is for videos. A codec can be also an implementation of such a specification, either in software or in hardware. The hardware codecs are usually an IP block, integrated peripheral, found on an SOC system on chip. Codec specs are not terribly complicated, but usually there are a lot of variants and special cases, and it all adds up to the overall complexity. And actually, the specifications have become richer over the years, too. Let's look at selected codecs to see the progression. The bars in the graph represent one over compression ratio, so to say, how many times is the raw data compressed? Uh, the numbers are just rough estimates to give you the general idea rather than to precisely describe each codec performance relative to other codecs. The, the codecs in the graph, looking from the left, are MJPEG, which is still in use in some applications today. For example, some webcams use MJPEG. MPEG-2, by the way, the patents for MPEG-2 expired worldwide this January, except in Malaysia, where they will still be uh, valid for the coming 11 years. So if you are not in Malaysia, you can use MPEG-2 royalty-free. Then there's H.264, also known as AVC Advanced Video Codec, H.265, known as HEVC High Efficiency Video Codec, AV1 and H.266, also known as VVC, Versatile Video Codec, which by some people is considered a tad better than AV1, hence 61 as the value in the graph. The efficiency of codecs, as you can see, is increasing and so is their complexity. So it is reasonable to expect that the newer the codec, the bigger the need for it to be hardware assisted, which translates into having to provide respective drivers. But before we look at examples of hardware codecs driven by upstream drivers uh, and their real life applications, let us first think for a while about kinds or categories of codecs. So a video codec can do either of two things. I hope you can help me 
uh, identifying this. So what do codec, video codecs do? Either of two things. They decode, bingo, what else? They encode, thank you, exactly. They encode and decode videos, but that's the easier categorization. They can do their job in either of two manners, and we can create a cross product between these two categorizations to form a nice two by two matrix. So the other categorization is state full versus state less codex. I talked about it last year in Prague. Long story short, a state full codec keeps and maintains its encoding or decoding state in the hardware, while a state less codec does not. And the, its encoding or decoding state needs to be kept and maintained elsewhere. This has consequences. For example, when you want to decode a frame from another sequence and then resume the original sequence with a state full codec, the codec needs to uh, recreate the state it was in when it saw the original sequence, which might require reprocessing several frames or maybe even an entire group of pictures. Whereas a state less codec just processes the next frame using whatever the state it is pointed at. On the flip side, users of state less codecs need to provide a lot of parameters on top of a subset of a bitstream, for example, part of which they also need to parse themselves. The trend is generally towards state less codecs, though. You can notice that one tick mark is missing. You will learn later in this talk why it is so. And now let us see examples of several codecs. These are example domains where you can find hardware video codecs driven by upstream drivers, some of which are listed in the following slide. This is a non-exhaustive list in no particular order. So there is Coda, which uh, is used by Safran, former Zodiac, in aircraft infotainment, or by Bosch in car infotainment, or by Agbrain in farm tractors. There's Venus from Qualcomm, which has been used in Chrome OS and Android devices. Wave 5 from Chipsen Media, uh, found in TI chips, which is automotive oriented. MFC from Samsung, and that is exactly the codec I was talking about in the beginning of this talk. It's been used in Android devices. There was a Chromebook with an Exynos chip and a number of development boards from a company called Harsh Kernel. Tegra is an old-ish uh, codec from NVIDIA, which has found its interesting niche in drones. Then there's RKV DEC and RKV ENC from Rockchip, which is used in set-top or media uh, boxes. And then there's Hantro, also known as VeriSilicon, uh, which, uh, when part of an IMX.8 from NXP, is used in automotive. Safran uses it in infotainment, Blaze in AI, uh, Intel Movidius for augmented reality, ST Micro in their STM32 MP25 chip, uh, Microchip in their SAM A5D4 uh, chip, and there's VN and VDEC from MediaTek used in Chrome OS uh, devices. So let us recap what we have seen so far. A codec is either a specification or its implementation in software or in hardware. Growing efficiency implies growing complexity, which, incre which increases demand for hardware acceleration. To take advantage of hardware acceleration, drivers must exist. There are stateful and stateless encoders and decoders. We have seen example uses of codecs driven by upstream drivers. Now, let us move on to a bit of history. I don't know if you have seen the movie The Holdovers. The history teacher in this film says a great sentence. You see, history is not simply the study of the past. It's an explanation of the present. I cannot imagine a better way to encourage you to listen to some explanation of the present of hardware codecs support in Linux. If this were a date, then the computers, the way we know them, did not exist yet. The transistor would not be invented until 1947, but three Polish mathematicians, Rejewski, Ruzycki and Zygalski, had cracked the Enigma three years before, 
the Germans kept improving the system and at some point the Polish started lacking resources to keep up, so they passed their results to the British, who at Bletchley Park continued where the Polish left off and then the Colossus was created, except that this number is actually a kernel release, which happened around 2010. My colleagues at Samsung R&D Center in Warsaw, Poland, Paweł Ościak and Marek Szyprowski contributed MEM2MEM -mem framework. It was meant for devices which are both output and capture. If you are not into video for Linux, then this naming might be a bit confusing to you because perhaps you would want source and destination instead. To understand these names better, you need to move uh, 25 years back in time when video for Linux was started. A popular kind of hardware at that time was an analog TV grabber card, which received analog TV signal, tuned to a particular frequency and kept digitalizing received frames and passing this data to a computer. Such a device was capturing uh, the frames, hence its class name. There were, of course, devices doing the converse, which were transferring the data in the opposite direction from a computer to the harder hardware in order to output it. And MEM2MEM -mem framework was meant for devices doing the two at the same time, transferring data to the hardware and receiving processed data, because nothing like that had existed before in Video for Linux 2. It had to be decided how this is arranged, what happens when an interrupt is received, how to coordinate between the two video queues, and so on. According to the commit message, the MEM2MEM -mem was meant for devices such as resizers, rotators, or color space converters. No mention of video codecs. It was later that same year that the subsystem patches started being tagged media rather than V4L slash DVB. Early the following year, at kernel release 2.6.39, which by the way, was the last kernel release of the 2.6 series and the last using three number versioning. The following revision was 3.0. The same two guys upstream VideoBuff 2, a successor to VideoBuff. It was meant for as an intermediate layer between user space applications and device drivers, also providing low level modular memory management function for drivers. It was a set of functionality that all Video for Linux 2 drivers would have to otherwise keep reproducing. So VideoBuff 2 defines planes. For example, a color component of a video frame can be stored in its own plane. VideoBuff 2 abstracts the memory plane data is allocated from. It was either memory mapped memory or user pointer memory, which is allocated by the user and then the user passes the pointer to it via the UAPI. Later, DMA buff uh, support was added. A video buff to buffer consists of several such planes and buffers are stored in a video buff to queue. Video buff to also keeps track of each buffer state so that, for example, the CPU does not attempt to modify the buffer while it is uh, owned by the hardware or vice versa. Another colleague from the same team, Kamil Dembski, in late 2011 at kernel 3.1 upstreamed the very first video for Linux 2 video codec driver for the MFC, multifunction codec, found in Samsung chips. Initial support was for S5P V210 and Exynos 4. By the way, uh, the driver featured stateful H264 encoder and decoder and at that time there was no distinction between stateful and stateless because only stateful hardware existed. Seeing the history in perspective, we now use this kind of codec classification. Again, history being explanation of the present. The driver used and uses to this day the MEM2MEM -mem and the VideoBuff2 frameworks. Note how the former, despite its commit message, turns out suitable for something more than resizers, rotators, or color space converters. The context of all these contributions was Chrome OS team partnering with Samsung and Asus to create the first ARM 
Chromebook. I want to mention another driver, not because it's a terribly important driver, but because it's important to me, because I contributed it. It was a driver for a JPEG codec found in the same chips as the above mentioned MFC, and I upstreamed it in early 2012 at kernel 3.3. Later that year, a very important moment happens. A video codec driver from another vendor lands upstream in 3.7. It was from Javier Martin writing software for chips and media. The driver was for Coda and it featured state full MPEG-4 and H.264 encoders. From this moment on, the upstream support of hardware video codecs has not been a Samsung monoculture. However, the start of this era was not great. You would expect user space written with MFC in mind, working correctly with Coda, but there were some problems. For example, in how the two mark end of stream MFC raises an interrupt while Coda signals with the last frame. Obviously, something had to be done. At LinuxCon Europe 2012 in Barcelona, Spain, Talks started and continued until ELC 2014 in Düsseldorf, Germany. This resulted in a de facto stateful codec UAPI implemented in, which was later implemented in already existing MFC and CODA. But it was not until 2019 and 2020 when stateful decoders and encoders specifications were merged upstream. They were merged by Tomasz Figa, who originally was the member of the same team that upstreamed Mem2Mem, VideoBuff2, or the first video codec driver. However, at the time of spec submission, Tomasz was affiliated at chromium.org. You can see that it takes time to settle on what the spec and the UAPI should be. First, it takes some considerable amount of thought, and then it also takes the maintainers to become confident that what you want to merge is the right thing. Having that experience in mind, with stateless codecs, the community has been smarter, and this time we started with stateless decoders UAPI before merging the drivers. Only this time the process was more difficult because unlike stateful decoders, which are fed compressed bitstream and figure everything out internally, stateless decoders need to be passed a lot of parameters, found for example in frame headers such as SPS, sequence parameter set, or PPS, picture parameter set. The UAPI should be broad enough to at the very least cover all decoders available as at specification release time, and this required a detailed study of available decoders and resulted both in UAPI controls and stateless decoder specification in upstream Linux, which was merged in 2019 by Alexandre Courbeau, affiliated at chromium.org. The context this time was Chrome OS team working on second generation ARM Chromebook. And in the meantime, in 2018, Hans Verkuy upstreamed the request API in 4.20, which by the way was the last kernel release from the 4. something series. To understand requests better, let's think for a while about an old-style output device which receives frames from computer memory and generates a signal suitable for broadcasting. Let's suppose uh, there is some control in the device, not necessarily a physical knob, but some hardware setting controllable from the software. The control is maybe used to set the brightness or contrast or saturation in the generated signal. If frames uh, a and B have been emitted, and from frame C on, you want this parameter changed, the control needs to be changed, but think what happens if we, if we want uh, this control setting applied for each frame separately. We need to wait until the previous frame is done, but before the next one is started, then apply the setting, then refrain from changing it until the current frame is done. And this is exactly the problem which requests in Video for Linux to solve. They offer you a framework to apply control settings for each frame separately and not have to worry about the above mentioned timing issues. 
The fundamental concept in that framework is a request object, which is created per each uh, frame. In video codecs, requests are useful for associating an output buffer, and by now you already know what output means in this context, context uh, associating an output buffer with a set of controls to be applied when processing a particular frame. And in stateless codecs, there's a lot of parameters to be associated with a frame. Now, given the existing work on stateless codec spec and this requests API, in 2018, at the same kernel release, Paul Kociałkowski from Butlin upstreamed a driver for Cydros, also known as Video Engine in all winner chips. It featured a stateless MPEG-2 decoder. An interesting fact is that this effort was crowdfunded on Kickstarter. Another interesting fact is that the relevant UAPI was uh, moved from public headers to staging soon after merging the driver, but before 4.20 was released. It turned out not stable enough, but keeping it in staging allowed working on it until it becomes good enough to be destaged. On a flip side, the concept of a staging new API can also backfire a bit, uh, because if it's not an official Linux new API, then people might be reluctant to use it. And how do you make this new API mature enough uh, to be fully merged upstream? By having people use it, which creates a chicken and egg dilemma. You will hear more about how we intend to solve it the next time it happens in the part of this talk about the future. So here we are in 2024. I am not mentioning other codex history, not because I consider them unimportant, but once the spec is merged, adding a new driver is usually just following the existing example, unless the hardware is unique, which can of course happen. There are about 10 video codec drivers, plus, plus a couple of them in staging, some of the drivers supporting numerous variants of the hardware, so it is a safe bet to say that tens of hardware kinds are supported upstream. What if you wanted to contribute a new codec driver? When submitting a codec driver upstream, you should, as always, provide V4L2 compliance report. For decoders, you should include a Flaster score. Flaster is an open source tool used to test decoders' compliance. We ask you to run Flaster and to document the failures, if any. Later on, we just ask to report if the score moved or stayed the same to see if there are no regressions. For encoders, there is no suitable tool yet. Of course, as part of your submission, it would be really nice if the driver you submit worked. Enough history and present, let's now try predicting the future. Talking about the future, we need to look at two horizons. There is pending work, which is expected to be upstream soon-ish, the order of months or one, two years, and there is more distant future, five to ten years from now. Let us first look at the pending work. You remember that the 2x2 two two matrix in the beginning of this talk was missing one tick mark. It was for stateless encoders, which are still missing. I mean, the hardware does exist, but there is no support uh, in the upstream kernel yet. An additional, ad additional difficulty to add this support is that uh, in modern codecs, the spec says uh, only what a valid bit stream must conform to and how to decode it but it says little to nothing about how to come up with a valid bit stream. Last year, I posted an RFC for a stateless VP8 encoder. Later, last year, STMicro, in cooperation with Colabra, posted an RFC for an H.264 stateless encoder. So there are already two RFC quality uh, stateless encoder drivers, but the stateless encoder spec is still missing upstream. Now, this is where we come back to the chicken and egg dilemma of a so-called staging UAPI. 
The staging UI API was good when stateless decoders were being specified because at that time we, the community, were learning about stateless codecs. Now that we do have experience and do know about stateless codecs, it seems a better approach is to merge the UAPI directly to avoid the said chicken and egg uh, dilemma. Venus replacement. Venus is actually the name of the firmware. Its replacement will be called Iris and will run on the same hardware. The intention is to have uh, a new driver and for the two drivers, the old and the new, to coexist for some time. It is likely that the new driver will not use the mem to mem framework. Raspberry Pi. So far, Raspberry Pi is or has generally been open source, but not necessarily upstream. There is a work by a volunteer to merge the Raspberry Pi codec support upstream. The codec is called MML and it features H.264 and MJPEG encoders and decoders, MPEG4 and H.263 and VP8 decoders and provided a license fee has been paid, an MPEG2 decoder. I don't know how this relates to MPEG2 patents expiring last January. Chips and media. We can expect new Wave 5 features. 4 to 2 subsampling support, 10 bit support, HAVC high profile support, and perhaps some new encoder controls. Notably, ROI, region of interest, is missing. And who knows, maybe Wave 6 will come to be. So that's the pending work on codec drivers. Not so difficult to predict because there are patches circulating already. Let's try predicting the not so distant future. We can expect an 8K driver for RK3588. And for a, the, uh, a bit older, RK3399, we can expect an encoder and decoder. By the way, in this uh, latter chip, there are two sets of codecs. Uh, Hunter, also known as very silicon, and that generally has drivers upstream, and Rockchip's own RKV Enc and RKV DEC. Codec conformance tests. For decoders, we already have conformance tests with Flaster. So if new codec specs appear, we will likely see new test classes and new test vectors added to Flaster. With encoders, we would love to have a conformance test tool, but that's a trickier uh, case than with decoders, because in modern codecs, understood as specifications, encoders are not specified. So while with decoders, there's only a single possible way a given bitstream should be decompressed, with encoders, multiple variants of a valid bitstream are possible, which means that there are multiple potentially different, yet visually correct, decompressed variants of the original video being encoded, which means that there is no single expected result so there is no easy way to automate this process. Maybe we can have some heuristic assessment of how close to or how far from the original video an encoded and then decoded video is and then have a threshold to decide whether the encoding result is good enough. The following predictions will be for the distant future. Mem to mem. It dates back to a historic kernel release from 14 years ago. Just to set this in context, in 2010, iPhone 4 and Galaxy S, just S, no number, were released, so pr pretty long time ago. What served well the very first upstream codec, which was MFC from Samsung, will not necessarily serve well all other codecs. And indeed, not all uh, memory-to-memory uh, drivers use mem-to-mem -mem framework. A legitimate concern is how to support multi-core codecs, where cores can be, for example, bound together to handle larger 
resolutions, or they can be used to do entropy decoding and frame reconstruction in parallel to speed up the process. So we might see something being created. On the other hand, challenging an, an, existing, an existing status quo is easier said than done, so we will see. And very distant future, convergence of stateless and DRM. It turns out that uh, the workflow of using uh, GPUs in DRM is similar to the workflow of using uh, stateless codecs in video for Linux too. So who knows, maybe in some distant future, we will see uh, stateless codecs migrating uh, to DRM, who knows. Uh, then there is also Vulkan Video. We don't know how it will relate to future uh, kernel uh, APIs. So let's summarize. You have learned what video codecs are, a spec or an implementation. You've seen what categories of codecs there are, and you have seen examples of codecs driven by upstream drivers in real-life applications. You then learned about the key points in codec support history in upstream Linux kernel, and then we tried predicting the future. That concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? There is a mic for you. So I was curious to know why we need an encoder spec because if I have used my encoder and generated the bit stream and if I uh, use a standard decoder like as provided by the spec ITU or one and if it's able to decode that stream then isn't my encoded stream good enough and it indirectly proves that encoder is good. So the question is why do we need a spec, a specification in the for the encoder, because if uh, encoded stream is, uh, the decoder is able to decode the encoded stream correctly uh, without any errors, then it indirectly tells that encode, encoder did the job correctly. Uh, so we, sh we should not confuse uh, two things. Uh, uh, in, uh, the, in codex specifications such as H264, for example, A AV1 or whatever, the encoders are not specified indeed. But uh, uh, in the Linux kernel, we need to know uh, what, an, what a stateless uh, encoder is, what kind of controls there are or there, sh there should be to control such a codec. And that's the kind of specification I, I was talking about. Oh, sorry, I was talking about that uh, similar to Fluster, like the test, test specification or the test framework. Like for decoder, you, you said we need Fluster compliance. Mm -hmm. uh, for, the, for the encoder, uh, is it okay? Like if I pass the encoded stream to the decoder and uh, run the Fluster compliance, that. Yeah, that's, that's basically correct what you are saying. Once the stream decodes correctly, it means that the encoded stream is, uh, is correct. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, if we don't have someone look at the actual contents, then perhaps the stream is uh, syntactically correct, but the contents is correct, corrupted. Right? So, that is why we would like to have some tool that uh, uh, verifies that uh, the contents is actually visually correct. But as you are saying, uh, it is enough to um, pass an encoded bitstream to a decoder and if a compliant decoder can decode it, that means that the encoder did its job well. Thanks. Thank you. Any other question? Um, not sure I missed it or maybe you didn't mention, but what are the reasons M2MEM is not suitable for modern needs? Uh, I wouldn't say it's not suitable for modern needs, but it's, it might be not suitable for uh, 
some uh, modern codecs, which uh, are, for example, multi-core codecs, and they can do their uh, their job in parallel. For example, they can do entropy decoding and uh, reconstructing a frame at the same time. And the reason is that originally, mem to mem creators simply did not envision such a scenario. But again, it was 14 years ago, right? So. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thanks for the <clears throat> thanks for the talk. Um, I was just wondering if you knew the status of like user space libraries of using um, stateful, stateless, and requests like FFmpeg or GStreamer. And they do. They, they do support it. Fully or up. Um, yeah, I mean, to merge a driver upstream or UAPI upstream, I'm talking about the Linux kernel, you need user space uh, users, right? So uh, the, a prerequisite, a, a must-have condition is uh, to have some user space using it, and the go-to user space is GStreamer or FFmpeg. So they do support uh, stateless and requests. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, I just wonder uh, why the state list could become a trend? Do you have any idea for it? Um, well, it, it's probably difficult to say whether stateful or stateless is better. It's like asking tea or coffee, yes. <laughs> um, probably depends on the, on the application, but it seems that stateless are more versatile because you can easily handle several streams at the, at the same time, uh, while with stateless, if the state is, is built into the uh, codec, then if you need to change that state, the, the hardware needs to you know, recreate the state. So I guess that's uh, one of the, uh, of the reasons. Uh, the other reason is that, um, I would say, uh, with modern CPUs, parsing a bit of a bit stream in decoders is not a real problem. Um, but what uh, really needs uh, support is the you know inverse DCT uh, transform uh, quantization and so or dequantization and so on. And that's where uh, hardware assistance is really comes uh, really comes in handy. Um, so I would say these are the. Uh, the reasons why, state, why stateless uh, uh, codecs are becoming maybe more popular. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, thank I you. That, uh, stateless, uh, the stateless, stateless codecs are lesser area in the hardware, so the hardware is simple and it kind of saves area in the SOC, so that could be. Uh, it could be you trade, uh, you know, uh, the amount of software support needed to run your hardware codec against the amount of uh, transistors. Right. So that, that could be also a reason, yes. Any other questions? I will ask one more. Yep. Uh, so I was kind of transitioning from OMX API to V4L2 for, for the codecs. And I see like some of the controls are missing. Like for example, if I have to pass an SCI U do you message uh, you, uh, to the uh, codec uh, or something, then uh, I couldn't find any specific S control or EXT control for that. Yeah. So, so you are transitioning from other API to V4L2? So I had used uh, OpenMax API uh -huh. for it. So there we had some OMX extensions for these kind of things like SCA prefix and all, mm -hmm. but uh, the V4L2 uh, API, I could not find uh, how to pass the SCA uh, information uh, using the V4L2 API to the code I can. That, so. What can we do? You're invited to <laughs> provide support. Yeah. So is like, uh, maybe uh, is it okay to propose uh, those as controls like that or? I mean, it's open source. You can propose anything as long as you have good arguments. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the 
uh, the next uh, occasion to do it is the Media Summit, which will be held somewhere in the autumn. Austria, yeah. Also, like this spec is kind of tied. The uh, V4L2 spec for the codec is kind of dependent on the V4L2 spec for capture. Because let's say I'm using capture to encode, and if uh, the capture, uh, the resolution changes, then they kind of need to be in sync with each other. So those also, I was not able to find exact spec on how to do, how to handle these kind of use cases in sync with the capture and the codec. So. Uh, and what the question is? So let's say I'm encoding a stream and there's a resolution change, like mm -hmm. I'm changing the camera resolution from 1080p to 480p, uh -huh. uh, then how, how do I handle this state uh, using the V4L2 API? Okay, okay. so re recently a new feature was merged, which is uh, remove buffs, I think, and its purpose is exactly handling resolution change. So you might want to have a look at uh, the remove buff uh, IOCTL, which was added just recently. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any question? Any other questions? If no questions, then thanks for coming.